Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Ready to get back in our Father's Word. Chapter 19, the great book of Revelation, the unveiling. It's kind of a recap after Babylon is destroyed. It kind of gives you an overview of what transpires there and something you really want to work forward to because you want to be a part you want to participate in some of the events that transpire in this chapter. Chapter 19, verse 1, a word of wisdom from our Father, and it reads, And after these things, that's to say the falling of Babylon, the going down, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Alleluia, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Alleluia is the Greek equivalent of the Hebrew hallelujah, which is to be translated, praise ye the Lord. And here they are praising him, and boy does he have it coming, because he has um, um, used, as, as stated, uh, the vengeance upon the enemies of God's children. Verse 2, for true and righteous are his judgments. He never misjudges. For he hath judged the great whore, which did corrupt the earth with her fornication, and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And uh, you'll remember back in chapter 6, verse 10, where those that had already died defending Almighty God who were under the altar would say at the fifth seal, Father, how long before you avenge our blood on those on earth? Well, here is fulfilled. He, he avenged it. Vengeance belongeth to our Father. He always takes care of business. Even the very prayers, as we learned in, in a prior chapter, in a chapter of this great book of Revelation, they're in, in, a, they're in a bottle. God saves them. He knows what you pray for, and He knows when to answer it. Why? Because He loves you. That's what this is all about, is God's children. His, his reclaiming those that would love Him and moving out those that will not. And so it comes that time when, but He's always fair and He's always just. He's always righteous. Who are these, who, who was it again that made up the great whore and the waters that she rode on? They're God's children, people from every tongue and nation. And many of them, if you believe in the traditions of men rather than the Word of God, you'll probably be in that bunch. Not a good bunch to be in. Why would he call it fornication? Well, it's really idolatry. He, but he puts it fornication so you could understand his emotions, how he feels about it when his children will not read the letter he's written to them would not take his instructions on how to be happy and peaceful in these flesh bodies. And naturally, uh, that day comes when sooner or later, it's one day too late, Charlie, and vengeance strikes. And naturally, this makes all that wait in heaven, as we learned back in chapter 6, verse 10, under the very altar of God, that the enemies are taken down, and they will be. Verse 3, and again they said, Alleluia, and her smoke rose up forever and ever. You know, a lot of people take this then and, and they say, they're going to be in that lake of fire right there in heaven and they're going to fry like a piece of bacon right in front of us and the smoke's going up forever and ever and we're in heaven. I don't call that really much of a heavenly view I don't, um, I wouldn't get too many kicks or pleasure out of watching somebody fry like a piece of bacon forever and ever. That isn't my opinion of heaven, nor is it God's. 
But that's what some so-called preachers would have you believe. Now, <clears throat> where is it written exactly what happens? What does forever and ever mean? Well, uh, I don't know how much you've been around a consuming fire, but in the 37th Psalm, you're not going to have it, but make notes. In the 37th Psalm, it is an acrostic psalm. The verses are uh, in the acrostic or the, the each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And, and um, every stanza, the, every verse is four stanzas long except for three, which are only three stanzas long. And the message is, uh, well, I'm going to read it to you. The first comes up on Psalms 37, the seventh verse. This is the question. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for Him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospereth in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Th this is the most often asked question. Why does it seem like the wicked always get ahead? Why does it seem like they're always the lucky ones? This is God's answer to that, and He hides it in an acrostic in this 37th Psalm. You find it in the 7th, 20th, and the 34th verse. The answer forever and ever comes in verse 20. Set aside and highlighted in the acrostic so that you can't miss it. Verse 20 says, But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as, now, now hang on to this, shall be as the fat of lambs, they shall consume into smoke, shall they consume away. Now, it didn't say they're going to be like a lamb sitting there on a, on a spit turning and, and burning. It said they're going to be like the fat of the lamb that drops from the spit into the fire and goes up in smoke forever and ever, which means fini. They're gone forever and ever. When something goes up in smoke, it's absolutely gone forever and ever and ever. And, and um, it's a beautiful acrostic. This is probably one of the most asked questions. Why does it seem like the, the wicked always get ahead? And they're not. God's going to smoke them. Okay. But verse 34 gives the final answer. Wait on the Lord and keep His way. Christ is the way, you got it? And he shall exalt thee to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, thou shalt see it. Meaning, you're actually going to be there to witness this. But it isn't, some, it isn't a lake of fire that people simmer in forever and ever. They like smoke go up. Probably one of the better places to prove what God means by this is in Ezekiel chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, considering the cherub that covereth, which is to say Satan, Tyrus, the rock, the false rock. It states in verses 18 and 19 that he, he will be turned to ashes from within, a Hebraism that means fini, over, done with. In other words, heaven is a wonderful place. There's no tears shed there. And, and you know, uh, I think that pers a person using their common sense, if you were to see the picture that some people paint of heaven, that here is hell, and I mean, they're screaming and hollering, then how could they're, and they're your own relatives maybe. And, and you think that wouldn't bring a tear? In other words, it won't fly what some preachers try to put out. We have a loving God, and He simply makes it clear. I would think that for the English reader that the word blotted out would have a, carry a little weight. We'll cover that a time or two before we finish this book of Revelation. God simply blots them out. God spoke, no, God spoke and nothing became everything. God speaks again and something becomes nothing. God is a consuming fire. So, um, 
never let anyone, I mean, when one of the most terrible sights is for some preacher to say they're going to burn forever and ever right there and we're going to see it. We're right there in heaven. That's not heaven. It's not the heaven of our heavenly Father. Verse 4, back in uh, chapter 19, let's continue with it. And the four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God and sat on that sat up on the uh, throne saying, Amen, that's that, and Alleluia, praise ye the Lord. This will be the last time the Zun are mentioned in the book of Revelation. Verse 5, that's the, the beast, <coughs> the creature. Verse 5, And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great. And, and, and you should, because he's going to take vengeance. He's going to take care of business. You don't have a thing in the world to worry about, and nothing but, uh, but fear, but fear itself, because God takes care of his own. As long as you use good judgment and common sense and pray to him and talk to him, he will never leave you. He will never forsake you. Verse 6, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude, and as the voice of many waters, like many people, and as the voice of mighty thunderings, saying, Alleluia, praise ye the Lord, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And there, there he is. It's, it is in a mighty way, totally in control. And... Uh, and uh, totally in control. You know, God will allow many things on this earth. As a matter of fact, He even writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you want to be deceived, I'll send you some strong delusion. I mean, He'll help you out if you want to believe lies. Well, why would He do that? Because He sent you a letter of truth. And if you fail to read it and listen to a bunch of ratchet jaws, you're in trouble. And God wants you to know that. He's omnipotent, so listen to him. Verse 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. He deserves it. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Goon in the Greek tongue. Wife is a, I like to insert a little something here for what it's worth department. You know, God chose certain in a spiritual wedding, so to speak, in the first earth age called his election, and they are his wife in that sense, in that spiritual sense. But there is a bride where many virgins are going to take place in that. So you might think, it is amazing how the women of the great book of Revelation are illustrated and brought forth. One is Mother Israel that had that crown of 12 stars, which is the zodiac, spiritually speaking. And the other is that old harlot that would ride on deception and lies and, and misleading our people and deceiving them into actually worshiping the devil himself. And, and uh, that is she that is Babel, confusion. And it would seem that some people just love to hear confusion rather than the simplicity in which Christ teaches in worshiping our Father. But here, the wife has made herself ready already. Verse 8, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the li fine linen is... Now, you want to know what fine linen that you're going to wear in heaven is? What it consists of? Listen, the fabric is the righteousness of saints or the righteous acts of the saints. Every act that you commit as a set-aside one, that is to say in the favor of Almighty God, you just need a little more material and build up those righteous acts whereby God's on the throne, He's in control, and he expects his people to put his enemies under his feet, his footstool. And they shall, with God's help. But here, 
we have that particular person and we have that event right there, right before Almighty God. The wedding bells are ringing. I don't know. You don't want to be as, as Matthew chapter 25 would so state where half of them don't make it. As a matter of fact, when they finally show up, God says, I never knew you. Christ says, I never knew you. So you want to be ready for this and you want to have your righteous acts in order for it's very important. Verse 9 to continue. And he saith unto me, Write, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. This is the way the wedding's going down. Now, in, in the great book of Matthew, in, in Matthew um, 22, verse 11, Christ, Christ gives us, he said, hey, go out and call my children to the wedding when well, they won't come. Well, then open it up and call anybody that will come. That's whomsoever will. And finally, when the wedding possession gets there, this is what happens. I'm going to read it to you. Matthew 22, verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guest, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. How did he get in there? He didn't belong. That's why. How? Verse 12. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? Question. And he was speechless, couldn't say a word. Well, I was sitting in church all my life, but I was worshiping the devil here thinking it was you. But he couldn't say it, too much shame. Claimed to be a Christian, listening to preachers, but never chapter by chapter of what God had to say. You know, you know what happens to him? Verse 13, then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. So, I don't know, you want to be ready with that wedding garment. When, when it says many are called and few are chosen, that is God's workers, his elect. But there will be uncountable numbers that will be, find salvation due to the work of those elect, those chosen. But the main thing is, is you better have the right wedding garment on when he comes, and that garment is truth and righteous acts. It, it really, I can put it a different way. It means being honest. A mother that takes care of her family. Those are righteous acts. A child that respects his parents. Righteous act. A child that is abused, that also, when the child um, grows out of it and, and um, has the victory, those are righteous acts. Smiling at someone that needs a little lift, that's a righteous act. So these things all add up and they all come in place for that, for that uh, wedding feast that's going to come. But the main thing that will make that yarn grow is for you to be willing as one of God's elect to witness against the false Christ when you're delivered up, allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through you. Talk about a righteous act. That's a destiny, a purpose. It being foreordained by Almighty God, as it's written in Romans chapter 8. What a time to live, this generation. Verse 10 to continue in Revelation 19. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, this is the angel, okay? Fell at his feet to worship him. See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren that have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. What is the testimony of Jesus? The spirit of prophecy. Why would this one, there was an angel. Angel worship is a terrible thing. It's a sin. For this angel is simply a fellow servant that had died here on earth and was with the Father. And what an angel is, an angel means messenger. He brought the message. 
And when John fell down and started worshiping him, he said, don't you do it, you get up from there. You see, God is the God of the living. As some preachers would have you believe that these people are out here in a hole in the ground, they're not, they're with the Father. Only the flesh returns to dust. They're with Him in their spiritual body that doesn't age, doesn't wither, doesn't get old. Verse 11, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful. He was called what? Faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Come in this time not as a babe to be crucified, but coming with a rod of iron to do in the enemy, to do in the Antichrist. Verse 12, His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. Now I want you to remember back in chapter 6, verse 2, the white horse we had there. And I told you to remember it. What did he have around him? A cheap, fabric imitation. And I told you, that's the Antichrist. That's the very, one of the first seals, is for you to know that the Antichrist comes first. It is paramount in the knowledge of Almighty God and understanding His Word. But this is that gallant one, as it is written, <clears throat> written of even in the Old Testament, both first and second advent. In Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, it says he comes riding lowly on an ass, okay? That was the first time he was in Jerusalem. But in verse 10, he returns on that great white stallion, that steed, a man of war, ready to make, bring peace to the world by destroying or doing away with the enemy in converting or else. That's what it means. Verse 13, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. Well, he was crucified. And his name is called the Word of God. And that's why that word is, oh, ever, ever, ever so important. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And, and even in the first chapter of the great Bible itself, Genesis chapter 1, Every time a verse starts with the word and, that's a polysendent in the Hebrew tongue, and it means and, and a great deal more. What that means is, is there's a lot more meant than is written. It means and the Holy Spirit moved upon the waters. That's what the and means. And there he was with him in the very beginning, the Word of God. That's why it is so powerful. And that's why that um, He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. And every day you're in it is a good day. That's the very sign off of this program. Verse 14, And the armies w which were in heaven followed Him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, documenting they had many, many righteous acts, and they already had that apparel on. Many miss their loved ones that have gone on but God's putting together an army in heaven as well as here. And many of them are going to be on and in that army, coming back here, and as only they who have been persecuted directly by them, the enemy knows how to take, they know how to take care of business, to execute vengeance at his hand. Verse 15, And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he might, he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the furiousness of the wrath of Almighty God. It is here. It has come. And, and it's going to. We're, we're coming up to the labor pains of the end times when you see the earthquakes in diverse places, and you see all the cries of peace, 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 and we absolutely have no peace then you know that we're nearing that time when the Lord God Almighty is about to say, Enough! It is done! And so it shall be. But uh, understand, when He returns, there's no ifs, no ands, no maybes. You either are 
or you're not, because he is a fair judge. Many that had no opportunity to learn in this earth age will have an opportunity in the millennium because there's going to be teachers there. They're God's elect, and they will teach and reign with Christ for a thousand years to get all the bugs out that can be gotten out. That means problems, and those that can't will be swept away. Vengeance uh, belongeth to the Lord God Almighty. Verse uh, 16, And he hath on his vesta and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And there he is forever, a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Mary, whose father was of the great tribe of Judah, the king line, and Mary's mother was a Levitical priestess, meaning of the Levitical tribe, the priest tribe, meaning that with Almighty God being the father thereof, then the king line and the priest line come together and the order of Melchizedek welded in place forever and ever as he is the king and he is the Lord of Lords, the chief priest, the head of the church, the head of all religion, period, as he comes in that name, Melchizedek, with us and God with us. You can think of it also as the closing line in the great book of Ezekiel. El Shema is to say, God is there. Yahweh Shema, that is to say, is what is actually written, not El, but Yahweh. Yahweh Shema, God is there. Or the, around that white stallion, the Shekinah glory. And Shekinah means God dwells there. In other words, the return has taken place when he, as king of kings, comes in. Verse 17, And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying, To all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. I, I would have you make a mental note. The only vial that was poured out upon the people in the end times, which was not poured out as a plague in Egypt or ever used before as a plague, is the fourth that came from the sun. And that's where the real wrath transpires. And that's why this angel standing in the sun from the sun the Son of God, takes place. The sign and the, sin, the, the time of victory. Verse 18. That, and he says to these ravens, these, that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men doth both free and bond, both small and great. You know, they're all, why? Because what happens at this instant? We're all changed into spiritual bodies. You go totally into, into a different um, dimension and, and uh, time. <clears throat> and flesh is no more needed. Instantly you're changed, as it is written in 1 Corinthians 15, 50 through 52 from flesh into spiritual bodies. And uh, Zechariah chapter 14 has a better rendition, maybe a little gross, of how this change takes place, like wax, they melt away. But that's what it has reference to. It's a good thing. We're changing into spiritual bodies. No more pain, no more, no, no more disease, verse 19. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth, that's the, not the ten that Satan brings with him, but the ten on earth and their armies, gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. Amazing, what? What a bunch of losers. Verse 20. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet, that's to say the Antichrist, the one world beast system, 
and the Antichrist, those roles of Satan, they, that wrought miracles before him, Revelation 13, beginning with verse 11, 12, 13, and 14, uh, that had received the mark of the beast, on which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshiped his image, these both, these both who? Antichrist and the one world system were cast alive into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. Satan is never going to be allowed that office again. He's going into the pit and he will be released a short season, but not as the false messiah. It wouldn't do him any good anyway because through the thousand year reign, people are going to know he's a fraud. But what's almost unbelievable, as it is written in the next chapter, which we'll get into in the next lecture, there's still a lot of people that will follow him. That is, that is kind of, that is very difficult for one that loves our Father to understand. But certainly that's the way it is. So rest assured, don't let this throw you. It simply means that that old dragon, he's got a lot of names and titles, but these are two, the one world system and the role of false messiah he'll never be allowed to use again. Verse 21 to complete the chapter. And the remnant were slain with the sword of, them, of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. It's called the Word of God. And the Word of God makes a clean sweep. And again, I must tell you, you must know, as it is written in 1 Corinthians, Paul said, don't want you to be ignorant about this one thing, for in a wink of an eye, in a second, we're all changed into spiritual bodies. And that change takes place for both the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay, <clears throat> Why? Because they've got to be in that dimension for God to judge. Now, just because they're changed into a spiritual body doesn't mean their mortal soul has put on immortality. That's the big step. And we'll talk about this a little more in the next lecture. But there you have it. The 19th chapter summarizing the events and the very appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ when he returns at that se at, from the seventh trump in victory over all enemies. That's why you want to find it a real pleasure to serve him that's why you want to be able to say hallelujah, praise ye the Lord, because he loves us. Don't ever forget that. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the Mark of the Beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of The Mark of the Beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, right, all over Canada. If the spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Won't you do that? Just please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We don't judge people. God is the judge. Boy, is he good at it. Okay? You can't deceive him, and uh, you can't con him. Just talk to him and always be honest if you want blessings because it is from him that all blessings flow. Those of you that listen to By Short Wave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you and your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address. Again, always a pleasure. Now, you got a prayer request, you don't need that number. You don't need an address. He knows what you're thinking. You don't even have to say it out loud. Let him know you love him. That's what he wants from you. 
He wants that. That's why he created you, was for his pleasure. So always give him that pleasure. You'll be blessed when you do. Father, around the globe we come. We ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, and question time. We're going to go with Kevin from Michigan. Thank you. You're so very welcome. In order for there to be a one world order, the USA must be fundamentally changed to socialism by taking from those who work and giving to those that will not. Taking God out of everything, the so-called global warming with health care. Uh, Pastor Murray, do you see this as a sign well, of the one world system? Well, it is, but always remember, the one world system will not come to totality. It will not be a total um, uh, organization until the day that the ant dragon, Antichrist, Satan, lands on this earth. Then he puts it together. Man can't put anything together. That's why it's called that the one world system receives a deadly wound. Because it, it, it just can't make it. Man can't agree on anything overall, worldwide. But the minute who the, the big boy shows up performing miracles, he gives the orders and those people will obey. And that's the time that God's elect will shine like the morning sun by the Holy Spirit speaking through them as happened on Pentecost Day um, as the, that example from Joel chapter 2. Uh, Tammy from Tennessee, I, I'm a child in Christ, so I hope this question is not stupid. Well, it, it, no questions are stupid. What is a trump? I know there are there are seven, and the Antichrist will come at the sixth. Is it just a sign of times or a trumpet sounding? My husband and I learned to uh, love to learn from you and your brother, and uh, you both are a blessing to be able to hear toward the. My my son will be happy to know you think he's my brother. Okay, and um, uh, that would be a compliment to me. Thank you for that. Um, the, the trumpets, the reason you are given details of exactly what transpires and what the trump announced, you look for that action rather than a sound of a trump, okay? Because um, it, it, just like you would recognize the church of Smyrna in Philadelphia, not by name, but by deed, what's going on, what's being taught. And those are the only two churches Christ was pleased with. Tracy from New York. Do you think we are living in the last days? We do. We certainly do. This is, the five, this is the generation of the fig tree. And what is written in Mark chapter 13? When you see the, the parable of the fig tree, the shoot set out, then no, this generation will not pass until all prophecy is fulfilled. Those are the words of Christ. And that fig tree was... That shoot was set out in the year of our Lord, 1948. So we're way along into that final generation. Lee from Arkansas. Is it possible for someone with a drug problem to be one of the elect? Will that, will that people, person, still go to heaven with a drug problem? Well, you know, drugs are a sin to your health. And you might say, well, how could that possibly? They impair your thought process. You don't make good decisions. You probably have noticed that, haven't you? Well, it seemed I'm on such a high and I feel so good. Yeah, and you're dumb. Okay, Make dumb mistakes, dangerous mistakes. And Satan's going to know it, and he's going to offer you fix after fix after fix and watch you swing on the string. Okay, So you need to kick it. I mean, you're, you, Lee, are a man of God. You act like it. You get a hold of your bootstraps and you pull yourself up. Take charge. Let your spiritual body take charge of the flesh and tell it to straighten up and fly right. You can do it. And you need to be rid of that with no hang-ups because we are living in dangerous times. And most likely... 
Inasmuch as there are no sorcerers, which is pharmaceutical, which means drugs, utilized for highs or anything else, going to make it. So the chances are pretty slim, okay? You need to shake it. It's weak and shows weakness. T from Oklahoma, since we believe believers of God's word know there is no flyaway event, how do you think the ones that are deceived will be duped by Satan? Will it be, be um, done? Do you think like a mass hysteria or do you think it could be a great lying wonder? Well, he's going to do both. He's going to lie to them and he's going to perform miracles. But his message is, is, I've come to fly you away. And those that believe to fly away are going to flop right in there. They're, they're built ready for it. As a matter of fact, it's almost the mark of the beast. If you've already got that, you're already ready to fly. Okay. Right into his arms. And so, it, believe me, they are expecting Christ to return and they're out of here. Satan comes first. Five whole months performing miracles and loading his wagon, they'll be in it. And, and that, that, is, that gives me no pleasure. That is a sad state of affairs because there's a lot of senior citizens that have warmed a church pew, just a big old pew potato, sit there and listen to a preacher, but never crack the Word of God hardly to know that the Antichrist comes first. I'm supposed to be Christian, but you see, Christians are what worship instead of Christ because they worship Christ. They're loaded and locked for it, and that, that's a sad state of affairs, but it's true. Uh, Brian from Arizona, Revelation 13, 6. Please explain. Satan claiming to be God is one of the biggest blasphemers that there could ever be. It is blasphemy, the height of it, okay? That's when he's performing his, uh, trying to perform miracles soon after that, and when, when he appears in verse 11 of that same chapter as the, looks like the Lamb of God. He's even got two horns, which means he's got power. But it's the voice of the dragon, meaning he's nothing but the devil, claiming to be Christ. Uh, okay, we got um, Wayne from Illinois. Arnold, is, is it all right to ask Father for more wisdom and blessings that I may give more tithes and help others? I'm doing good, actually great, but would like to help more. Well, uh, you know, it never hurts to communicate with our Father. He wants you to talk to Him. If you, have, if you are driven and have that desire, let Him know it. Okay. And, and uh, leave it in His hands. Okay. Brian, Brian, no, it's Brianna. Brianna from Texas. I heard you say that Satan is the one that uh, takes people first regarding flying away. But in Luke 17, 30 through 36, it says when the Son of Man is revealed, one man will be taken and one will be left behind. Does that mean the uh, Christian will be taken by God and the non-believers are left behind? No. The subject is don't be deceived. You'll find it probably better written even in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, where the one is taken, Matthew 24. The subject is Antichrist comes first. If they say he's in the field or over there, don't believe it. Do not go. Okay. And, so the, and then he continues on in Matthew 24 and says it's going to be just like it was in the days of Noah. They're going to be giving and taking in marriage with fallen angels. So guess who gets took first? The one that is deceived and hops in Satan's sack thinking he's Christ. Okay. That was spiritually speaking. So the one taken, you do not want to be because they are taken right into Satan's own pit. Um, God said, blessed are those that remain in the field working until I come. And when he comes, you want to still be in that field working. Uh, Pat from California, when the devil returns to the earth for the five months uh, before Jesus returns, I want to know, will the Christians on earth have to go through the the torment for five months also. Well, um, it, but they don't consider it torment. Satan's not coming to torture people if that's what you have in mind, like torment. 
Satan is coming to hold a big revival to, to cause people to worship him. That's all he wants is people to worship him. He'll pay your mortgages off. He'll put a chicken in every pot. He'll give you anything you want. He comes in prosperously and peacefully. You'll find that out in the next, next book we do, Daniel. And, and, and that keeps a lot of people from being deceived because they're expecting brutality, torture, and, and uh, roughness, just the opposite. That's why he deceives so many people. And, uh, and so it is. We do not consider the hour of temptation to, to be torment. We consider it a blessing to be able to serve the living God to allow the Holy Spirit to speak through us as Romans chapter 8 I quoted earlier stipulates beginning with about verse 26. You don't even know necessarily what to pray for, but God does because you're foreordained to know and to stand against the enemies of God. Uh, Michelle from Tennessee, what does God want us to do when we are depressed? I pray, but what should I pray for? Well, to get rid of the depression. Okay. Uh, mainly, I, you know, you might read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says nothing's going to happen to you. It doesn't pretty well happen to everybody. And that God will never test you over what you're able to handle, and he will always show you a way out. So you pray for that way out. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Don't forget it. You know, depression is doubting the promises of God. And God himself, in Isaiah chapter 43, verse 26, he, he talks to you. He says, remind me of the promises I have made to you so that we can talk about it and I can justify you, which that means I can make it right with you. So you've got to talk to him about those promises. He hasn't forgotten them, but you've got to know where they are to claim them. That documents that you have studied the living word, that you know what those promises are. They're throughout the word of God to his elect and to others and conditions. So let him know and talk to him, okay? But you got to believe also, and depression sometimes is doubting God's word. I want you to get rid of that, okay? Because he loves you. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. M Michelle from Tennessee, uh, maybe this is the same person. How will we know when we are in the millennium? Will everyone or only a few people be delivered up to God? Now, we're all changed instantly. 1 Corinthians 15, 52. All good, bad, ugly, or you get into a spiritual body, which puts you simply in the same dimension as God is. And um, the millennium is a time of teaching. Those that do not make it will be taught there when they had no opportunity. And by what is being taught in a lot of so-called churches, there's a lot of them don't have a prayer of a chance. And I'm not judging, it's just a statement. If you don't know the false Christ is coming first and you haven't been taught, you're in bad shape. If your church doesn't teach what Smyrna and Philadelphia, the only two churches out of seven that Christ was pleased with, you're in a heap of hurt. But God doesn't play favorites. He just gives you what you got coming to you. That's why you want to kind of think about it and realize he's always fair and just. But he always likes to give people knowledge and wisdom if you'll get in there and work at it and, and ask for it. Ruth from Georgia, pillars, question. God refers to us as pillars. Could this be an example we uphold the Word of God? Well, that, that would be a cool way of looking at it, but I, I would like for you to go a little deeper than that. And probably you're quoting the third chapter of Revelation that we're just in now where God says, His elect and His elect only. That is the, churches, the church of Philadelphia and Smyrna make up the pillars that hold up the temple of God. They're the, they're the strength of God's temple, the many-membered body. And, and what, what, a, what a wonderful blessing 
for God to have that respect for his elect, how much he counts on them, that's all the more reason we can never, ever, ever let him down. And we won't. Okay, um, Brian from Georgia. What are all the different kinds of demons that can possess someone? I know there are, could possibly be a lust and a green greed demon. What are some others? How should one pray if they want to know what is God's particular will for their very own life? Oh, let's, let's don't call them demons. Let's call them evil spirits because that's what they are in the manuscripts and that's what they literally are. Is God allows for every negative and positive. We have the Holy Spirit, which is a beautiful, wonderful spirit. But at the same time, he allows the negative spirit, which is Satan's own spirit, with many of the Nephilim spirit, evil spirits that can possess people. But there are many, there's the spirit of jealousy, the, um, the uh, spirit of laziness. There are many, many spirits, and many of them are, are shortcomings also of the individual. But Christ gave us power in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, over all of our enemies, including these evil spirits. And you can order them out in his name. And you're, you're rid of all of them, and you want to include, be inclusive of all of them. Spiritual discernment, when you have a person that is well-centered in God's word that has spiritual discernment, can see an evil spirit even if it walked in the room behind that person, they can feel it, okay, that evil spirit, and so it is. But that spiritual discernment is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Lloyd from, and I want to say right away, there's not one behind every bush, but there are evil spirits. Uh, Lloyd from South Carolina, Han uh, my question is, how do I handle the ridicule that I'm receiving from loved ones? They judge me because of my past. I know that is Satan at work. I'm not a poor me baby. I know that Yeshua is my rock. I just need some advice for someone who has uh, had this experience. Well, it sounds like he's toughening you up for a pretty good wrestle, okay? It'll do you good, and you can cut it. The main thing is, if it's your loved ones, don't talk Bible around them when it, if it upsets them. And that brings on ridicule, and they will look at your past to down you, to, to try to put you down because they don't want to talk religion. But don't, don't overload their donkey. When, when you accept Christ, you become a fisherman. And when you fish, you gotta be gentle, okay, real gentle. And then when they hit the right question or some things, then sink the hook and gently roll them in. But you, you have to use wisdom. And you're supposed to be wiser than the serpent. So don't, don't let him come in, especially through your family, and be ridiculed. And, and if they do, hey, if you were bad at one time, so be it. That's part of the price. Okay. But you're a big boy. You get your big boy britches on and get set and you can handle it real good, okay? God's toughening you up for something and you'll be tough to handle it. You can do it. Nancy from Illinois. How should I go about telling my family about Christ without sounding stupid or they have, uh, can, they can, so they can really believe me? Well, you, you want to study to show yourself approved, rightly dividing the Word of God? so that you can gently bring it forth. I think the prior question kind of falls in with your, your line there. Be real gentle, okay? And I understand how hungry you are as a, new, as a new one to get to the truth and find the word and you're excited about it, but still cool the damper and be calm. And when, the very fact that you have that assurity in your own life is a witness of Christ's presence. Just the fact that you know how to handle things because you believe in him, and that, that, that shows. So just be gentle, love your kinfolk, and, and uh, bring them if they will. 
Question, Don in Tor from North Carolina, Donald from North Carolina, how long is a generation? A generation is 40, 72, or 120 years. It's according to which time in the Bible. How will, who will be taught in the millennium reign? Those that did not overcome. As it is written in 1 Corinthians 15, boy, I've quoted this a lot today in verse 52, um, this mortal must put on immortality. Mortal means soul. Not talking about body. It's talking about your very being, yourself, soul. Mortal means liable to die, which means you're liable to still go in that lake of fire. You must put on immortality, which means you must take part in either the first or second resurrection. And uh, to do that, you have to overcome. Those that do not take part in the first resurrection will be taught in the second that never had an opportunity. What are works considered as? I kind of went through that earlier, uh, just, just righteous acts. And so it is. That's what goes with us. And I'm out of time again. Hey, you know what? I love you all a great deal because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse. But that's nothing compared to how God loves you for studying the letter He has sent to you. It makes His day. And when you, little old you, make His day, boy, is He going to be pleased. He's going to bless you. He'll bless you real good. We're, we're brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, you bless God. He will always bless you. But you know what's most important? It's really, really important. I almost insist on it if you study with me. Stay in His Word. Every day in His Word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, He is the living Word. Hearing God's Word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.